Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 215, and for this one, we're in Austin, we're at the Lodge, playing the high stakes game that I played during the Lodge Championship Series, and you guys are gonna love it. But before we get started, a couple of announcements to make. I just wanna catch you guys up on what I've been doing lately. I didn't put out a video last week. Been very busy traveling between Austin, Las Vegas, and even LA, but uh, I fired in uh, three WSOP events, and I cashed in two of them. So my second board of this year's WSOP, I, I, I just happened to jump in a $1,500 limit hold'em event. Uh, I've always wanted to play a limit hold'em event, but never have in the past. And I actually haven't played limit hold'em in years and never a tournament with, uh, of, of, of that type. So that was pretty sweet. I got 66th in that. It was good to get on the board. And then I played the $1,500 shootout and uh, the way that that works is there's a thousand players, there are a hundred tables. If you win your table, you play down to a winner for your table, uh, then you advance to day two. So I won my day one table, which was awesome. It was a pretty tough table. And I advanced to day two. I ended up being the first one knocked out at my table for day two, but I got 77th in that. So uh, I'm on the board twice. I'm gonna fire in a couple more WSOP events and I'm gonna be playing a lot of WPT events. So the WPT is coming to Venetian. I'm really excited for that. There's a 5K main. There are a bunch of other different buy-in, uh, you know, uh, amounts, but uh, I'm gonna be playing a handful of those. And maybe Andrew and I can even do a meetup game at Venetian during that, or at least some type of get together. So more information on that in the future. But uh, I've, been, I've been playing a lot of tournaments. I've really been enjoying it. I've been knocking on the door of some big scores, haven't quite gotten one. Hopefully that will change soon. And then the last thing I want to mention is that um, I played 100-200 with Doyle Brunson, Maria Ho, Darren Elias, and a couple other big names for a televised WPT event a couple weeks ago. That was the coolest experience that I've ever had in poker. It was a bucket list thing for me to play with Doyle. That's gonna air on TV, I think at the end of this year, or maybe early next year, but uh, I can't wait for that to come out. And when it does, I'm gonna take the footage from that and make a vlog out of it, but that's gonna have to be on hold for a couple months, unfortunately, but uh, I, I'll, that'll, be, that'll be cool. I guess, I guess I lied. There's one more thing that I wanna say. Um, there were two vlogs that were taken down from my main channel on YouTube in the past, and I'm gonna correct the things that were that YouTube had issues with, they were minor things, and then I'm gonna post them on my new channel, Brado and Clips. So once you're done watching this video, uh, click on a link down below in the description box, I'll post it there, or maybe I'll, I'll pin it at the top of the comment section. You can check out uh, one of those new vlogs, or one of those prior vlogs, but uh, it's one of my favorites of all time. It's the first time I played a streamed game, and for years it was the biggest win that I've had in my poker career. So uh, I'm excited to have that one back up. Um, so I, I hope you guys enjoy this video. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Today we're playing the highest stakes cash game session that we'll be involved in while we're in town for the Lodge Championship Series. It's a packed house here. We have our 5K high roller going on as well as day two of our $800, 750K guarantee. We're in the cash game streets though, playing 510.20, the $5,000 max buy-in. We buy in for the most that's allowed. It's always a little nerve wracking to play on stream, but I've had some great results in the game lately. I'm well into the profit zone at the lodge, and I haven't lost on stream since Monster Meetup Week in January. Here's the lineup. You may recognize some games that we played with in the past, including Cedric, who famously crushed my world by calling an all-in preflop bet with 5-4 suited, then turned the straight against my ace king and another player's ace king in a massive five-figure pot. He's always fun to play with, He's happy to get in the mix, even if it makes me sometimes want to quit poker. Boston Jimmy, Sashimi, and Radley played against us on stream and have all been featured on previous vlogs before as well. We get off to a bit of a slow start. The most interesting thing that happens regarding me the first half hour is that the commentators Slick Rick and Skull Mike wager a sandwich on where I got the shirt that I'm wearing that says Austin, Texas across the front of it. Slick Rick thinks I got it downtown, and Mike thinks I got it at the airport. I don't think Brad. I don't think Brad is an airport. Uh, apparel purchaser. I think he's smarter than that. Airport so apparel is 30% more than anything else you'll see. While they're betting sandwiches on my attire, Cedric raises a 60 from under the gun with pocket fours. The dealer gets confused because Radley has such a similar name to mine and accidentally gives him the hand that was clearly supposed to be dealt to us. Radley three bets the Jiggities to 200. 
He's going to find out the hard way there's no right way to play those bad boys. We're in the big blind with Ace 4 of Hearts. We capitalize on the image we've cultivated so far this session with our lack of involvement by putting in the cold 4 bet to 700. We're coming in hot. Seti's pocket 4s isn't a $700 hand. He lets it go. The Jiggities are much better and it's only 500 more for Radley to call in position. The cold 4 bet just looks so strong. It's always very hard to beat us with our own hand while having the last 6 letters of our first name. Radley makes a snug lay down as a 2 to 1 favorite. It looks like I've got rockets. Instead, I have fake aces. Our first move of the day works out. There will be plenty of more similar plays though. Shortly after, Skull Mike takes a seat at the table to settle his bet with Rick for the sandwich. Listen closely. Hey, would it be as popular? Would you buy that shirt? Seven bolts, eight, 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 yes! Nice. There you go. Buddy. There you go. Sounds, sounds, sounds like a sandwich bed. I have an airport. Rick had downtown. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like a sandwich bed. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. We want to do the stand-up game with the hats. Can you pass the hats? Is it on the card? Yeah, we want to do it with hats. Brad, Brad. So, Skull Mike wins the sandwich bet. He's up one now. Slick Rick said earlier he thought I was too smart to buy a apparel at the airport. Well, I proved him wrong. Bad read, Rick. I'm an idiot. Boom. Roast it. To be fair, it was only $20 for the shirt, it didn't seem too overpriced. Next, we're first to act with Ace-King offsuit and the straddle to 40 on. We raise to 100. It folds to high in the $20 blind, he has Ace-10 offsuit and makes the call. We're heads up in position with the best hand. At least until the flop comes, Ace-Queen-10 with two hearts, we have top top, a gutter, and a backdoor flush draw, but high has the lead with top and bottom pair. He checks the trap, there's no reason to think that we're not best. Plus, we have a draw to the nuts and card removal making it less likely that we're up against two pair or a straight. We fire for 100. That's not the price we'll be paying to see the turn. High raises to 375. It's too early to give up on this given all that we have going for us. We call for 275 more, not exactly loving the situation. The most likely hand I put the opponent on is Queen 10 or some sort of combo draw like Jack 9 of hearts. The turn is the 5 of spades, it's a blank that eliminates our backdoor flush possibility. High keeps up the pressure with a bet of 675. It's getting expensive, but we have a lot of cards that can help us. In this exact scenario, we're getting 3 to 1 on a call and have nearly a 25% chance of winning the hand, so we're getting about the right pot odds to stick around, given what the opponent has, particularly if we factor in the possibility of winning extra on the river in the event that we improve. I call, it's a large pot, the river is the jack of hearts, we make a straight, but it isn't hidden, and the flush draw gets there. The good news is that holding the King of Hearts is very beneficial for us and having the Jack of Hearts come out on the board is decent as well since we can rule out the opponent having big combo draws on the flop like Jack 9 or Jack 8 of Hearts. It's a lot less probable that we're going to be up against a flush, especially when the opponent checks. I doubt he has a King, he seems genuinely disappointed with the run out, he'll have two pair a lot of the time and may not be able to call a big bet. We attempt to milk him with a tiny bet of 500. It's 20% the size of the pot, putting high in the blender. It's summertime, all we need to do is to add some rum, carousel, or jot syrup, lime juice, and a pineapple spear to top it off, then we'd have ourselves a high tie. High doesn't want to wait to watch the stream later to see what we're taking him to Value Town with. He wants to see it now, and he makes the call. We get a fortunate run out to win a nice pot. This is quite possibly my new lucky shirt, well worth any airport premium. We're up 2400 so far while wearing it. Five hands later, Daddy Dev has King Queen suited under the gun plus one. I prefer to avoid calling another full grown man daddy, so we're not going to be using that nickname anymore. Double D raises to 100, we're on the button with 9-7 suited. Ordinarily this would be a fold, I'd like to get in the mix though, I make a wider call than I should. We're heads up in position, the flop comes 10-6-6 with two hearts and a spade, we've got a gutter and a backdoor flush draw. The opponent takes a small stab at it for 65. We're getting over 5-1 to one and have 40% equity, we call. I'm glad we did because the turn is the eight of diamonds giving us a hidden straight that we'll almost never have. The only problem is that our opponent has nothing. That doesn't stop him from continuing to fire. He increases the bet size to 155. Sometimes I'll flat with the straight to trap. For instance, if we had the flush draw with two hearts, I'd just call. In this case, there are too many bad river cards for us. I raised to 500 in order to charge the draws and get more money in before the opponent could potentially take the lead or before another card comes out that might dissuade the opponent from wanting to put more chips in the pot. Unfortunately, the player has air and folds. We show him that we drilled the gutter ball, we're running great and hitting the cards we need to today. I don't get the chance to get involved for quite a while until we pick up a premium hand, 8-4 suited on the button. It straddled to 40, so I raised to 100. This is another holding that we could easily let go of preflop, especially in a 3-blind game with a straddle on, making it so there are 4 players behind us. 
I have a couple things going for me though. Number one is that I haven't been dealt too many playable hands, so it probably appears to my opponents as if I've been playing tight, when in fact, I've just been card dead. I've also only shown down strong hands, so my image is solid, and I should be able to get away with a little more than usual. Radley's the only color in the under the gun straddle, we're heads up in position, the flop comes ace-jack-7 rainbow, we've got complete garbage, just a backdoor straight draw. This may come as a surprise to some of you, I'm not too mad about the flop. The reason for that is because as the preflop raiser, I'll have all the sets in my range, two pair combinations, and hands like top top. Radley checks, it's time to cash in on the image that we've crafted, we bet 125. Radley isn't going anywhere with his ace, he's not feeling great about his kicker though. He cautiously flats. The turn is the ten of spades, we pick up a gutter and have removal to the straight. Radley checks again, since in our opponent's mind, we can have potentially every one of the strongest hands possible, and we haven't gotten caught bluffing the session, we still go for it, betting 375. I'm not sure why this is the only camera angle of this hand, but Radley's in a very difficult spot with only one pair. It's easy to watch and think that he should definitely call because he has over a 90% chance of winning. In reality, he only has a bluff catcher. He'll often be drawing dead, and if he calls this bet, he may have to face a much larger river bet if he wants to get to showdown. The opponent folds, we steal one with nothing and are up nearly 3,000. Here I've straddled the 40, Radley needs to punish me, he raises to 120 from the button with ace-jack offsuit. He has us completely dominated as we look down at queen-jack offsuit. We're getting a discount and call for only 80 more. We're heads up out of position, the flop comes queen-jack-6 rainbow, we've got top two pair, and check it to the preflop raiser. The opponent could reasonably check back his pair of jacks, instead he fires for 100. Raising is a good option, I like to trap with a call. The turn is another 6, I'll have tons of 6's in my range, this is theoretically a much better card for me. If I check, I imagine the opponent will check back a ton of hands, especially second pair hands like ace jack or king jack, but he will also check back straight draws, there are a lot of possible straight draw holdings at the moment. I don't want to give the button an opportunity to get a river for free, I lead for 250. My line looks suspicious, Radley's tired of folding to me, he calls while drawing slim. The river is the king of diamonds, it's the worst card in the deck for queen jack, not only do straights get there like ace-10 and 10-9, but also brick straight draws like ace-king, king-10, and king-9 improve to have a speed as well. Additionally, king-queen and king-jack have also taken the lead. I check with plans of folding to a bet. Radley has showdown value and thinks perhaps I have something strong, he doesn't need to turn his hand into a bluff. He checks back with one of the few hands that he'll have that we're beating. Another pot goes to us, despite the value of our hand significantly diminishing with the runout, the way we played it will help strengthen our image and credibility because the only time we bet was when we were relatively strong. It's time for the Texas stand-up game. All the players have to remain standing until they win a pot. The last player standing loses and has to pay the other players $50 each. Dev raises to 110 with 10-8 offsuit in an effort to win a seat. Efan, better known as McLovin in prior episodes, calls in the hijack. I hate standing, which is why I chose a profession where I can sit almost 100% of the time. I call with 8-6 suited on the button. Three of us are seeing the flop and we're in position, it comes 5-4-4 rainbow, we've got another gutter with two overs and a backdoor straight draw. Dev never has anything against us, yet he's always betting, he makes it 125. Ethan actually has the best hand, which isn't saying much, he folds, I consider raising, but I don't really need to. We call with plans once again, making five cards in a row. There's the seven, and Brad is going to get to take a seat. It's a beautiful card that gives us a straight, and we pick up a straight flush draw just in case somehow we're no good at the moment. There's no slowing down from Dev, he bets 225. This is the second time we've been in nearly the same situation against the same opponent where we drill a gutter on a paired board in position. The first time we raised the turn, you may remember that I said, if we had a flush draw to go along with the straight, we'll flatten those instances. Well, here we have the flush draw. There are way fewer river cards to be worried about, so we call it a trap. Smooth call here for Bragg, and keep all the bluffs in play for Daddy Dev. A nice move from him, and now connects with the flush. The opponent has absolutely nothing. Our plan has worked out to perfection. We don't look like we're nearly as strong as we are. This induces a third barrel. The bet this time is for 500. That's a big increase from the turn sizing. When Dev bets all three streets, he's representing lots of strong hands, including ones that are better than an eight high flush. If I raise, I don't think we can get called by much worse. We call with the winner, Dev shows that he has air, we take down a big pot and earn our seat back, we're hitting all the straights today, it obviously has something to do with what I'm wearing. I predict that these Austin Texas shirts at the airport are soon going to be sold out because they clearly help you run good. We're up nearly 4,000 now. In this one, we're second to act pre-flop and raise to 100 with king-queen offsuit. 
Dev is in the third blind and is trying to get me back with 8-6 suited. He calls. Yi Fan wants to defend his straddle. He calls with Queen-5 of hearts. We're going three ways to the flop in position. The dealer puts out Jack-5-3 with two diamonds. No one hits it super hard. Yi Fan has middle pair and Dev has backdoor draws. We all check. The turn is the three of clubs. There are now two flush draws out there. Dev checks. Yi Fan has stuck a good chunk this session and likes to bluff a lot. He bets 250. When he does this, it's likely that he'll have complete air given his nature, or a lot of the time he could have one of the two flush draws. I can easily fold in this spot with only king high and no draw. I go a different route. I call with very devious plans to rep a hand like Jack's full on the river if I don't make a pair. Dev calls as well. I put both players on flush draws mostly. The river is another five, but the player formerly known as McLovin makes a backdoor full house. Dev bets 375, which doesn't make a ton of sense because if he had trip threes, he probably would have led turn or check raised turn. It would have been really difficult for him to call E fan's turn bet with a five after I called, unless he had a diamond draw to go with it, and that's not possible with the five of diamonds on the river. The hand gets more strange as E fan raises to 1375. E fan gets caught bluffing all the time. He can't be putting in a raise for value with a three, and I didn't anticipate him betting a five on the turn. It seems to me he's recognized that Dev's story doesn't make sense and is now bluff raising with a misdraw of some sort. The action's on me, and I can still credibly rep Jack's full. A big part of me wants to re-raise his bluff because I don't see how either opponent is going to show up with a full house all that often. And Brad has not folded just yet. So don't do it, Brad. Okay, good. Thinks better of it. I thought Brad had some ideas in his mind, but... Brad playing pretty snug, sound today, making zero mistakes. I'm surprised to see that E Fan actually has what he's representing for once. I'm glad that I didn't pull the trigger on an elaborate bluff that likely wouldn't have worked. If you listen closely, you can hear me tell the table that I nearly got way out of line. Wow, I almost just did something very crazy there. Nine hands go by, we're dealt ace 10 offsuit and raised to 100 from onto the gun. Eli straddle for 40, he calls for 60 more, we're heads up in position, the flop comes king queen deuce with two clubs, all we have is a gutter with one over but it's another flop that's good for our range as the pre-flop aggressor. Eli checks. We've got a draw to the nuts. We take a stab at it, betting 125. A lot of the time, this will win the pot when an opponent has something like, let's say, 7-6 offsuit. Not this time. Eli is a non-believer. He puts in the check raise to 425. To be honest, I'm not really buying what the opponent is selling. He would have 3-bet pre-flop with hands like pocket kings and queens. The best hand that he's representing here will be a set of deuces. He can have some two-pair combos, but... I just don't get the sense that he'll have a monster all that often, like he's representing. I don't want to fold, but I don't like calling here either. I still have only shown down really strong hands, I haven't been caught bluffing, and my image is great. Because I can have all the sets, top two pair, aces and ace-king combos, I announce a re-raise at 1200 is a 3-bet bluff. No need to get all the chips out there, Eli folds immediately. Nice move there from Brad. It's nice when you have a tight image at the table. Really haven't gotten out of line once at showdown. You're able to maneuver certain streets just because of your image. Semi bluffing there with the Broadway draw, but Eli's going to give him the respect he deserves, and Brad steals a pot there with a nice raise. That's the last big pot of the night. We got into several very interesting situations. There are occasionally issues with the cumulative winning scoreboard. Sashimi, for instance, definitely didn't finish with a profit that high. After several hours of play, I'm pretty sure we came out winning the most. <laughs> Today I won 34.50 and uh, it was just one of those days where things just really went my way. I, I made a bunch of gutters, which was pretty fun, and uh, got it, got my bluffs through. So everything worked out. We had a good lineup and uh, just glad to come out with the win. I've been doing pretty well here at the Lodge and right now it's packed. Huge tournament series going on, Lodge Championship Series, and as you can see, there are a ton of people here. Fun doesn't end just because the poker's over. We head into downtown Round Rock with a few people who we played against on the stream. 
We go to one of my favorite bars in the area called Brass Tap to enjoy a post-session drink. It's been fun to get to know the people who regularly play in Texas better. They're all great individuals who are a big part of why the Lodge is a special place. We keep the night going by heading to another bar called Eddie's, where Doug tries to pretend like he's not good at pool, when in fact, if Doug isn't studying how to beat people at the poker table, he's studying optimal angles on a different type of felt. He's a pool wizard, don't let him fool you. Finally, we cap the night off at where else? IHOP. We give our server Nala an $1,100 free roll. If she can finish 10 pancakes in under 12 minutes without throwing up, then she wins 500. If she eats an additional 11th pancake, our friend Jake has agreed to give her $600 for that one. Everyone in the entire IHOP has come over to watch Nala take on the challenge, which is about eight of us because it's two in the morning and no one besides our group and the staff is here. Nala's crushing it. She destroys the 10 pancakes in record time. It's down to the 11th pancake for all the money and in what can only be described as a veteran move, she wraps it into a burrito and stuffs her face until every morsel of the pancake has been consumed to win the entire free roll amount. Nala's co-workers couldn't be happier that she's $1,100 richer and a lot less hungry than she was just a few minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, I got one good here. We have, we have, we have 600 more on the side. Nice shot, nice shot. Wow, that was that was really, really impressive. That was like that was incredible. That's it for this one guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons because it helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comments section. I'm happy to get back to you. This was a fun session and just made a ton of straights. Ran well, I'm actually, I, I got off to a bad start in the beginning of this year, particularly at the Lodge, but since then I've completely caught up and if things keep going this way, I'm on pace to have a really good year and uh, so we just kind of need to catch up um, to where I'm at in real life with the vlogs and stuff. But yeah, everything's going great. If you wanna uh, see how I'm doing in tournaments, I don't really make vlogs of those. There's just too much stuff going on. I'm trying to concentrate, but you can follow me on Instagram because that's where I have all the tournament updates. And uh, I'll be playing a lot of WSOP and a ton of WPT events coming up. Very excited for that stuff. Also, be sure to check out the second channel, Brad Owen Clips. I have a link down below in the description box. You can check out some of the, the, the two missing vlogs from this channel. Um, kind of bothered me that my whole, you know, complete vlog body of work isn't on this channel. So uh, I wanted to have them up somewhere. I wanted to have those two vlogs somewhere in existence. So you can check those out, two of my favorite ones of all time. All right, guys. Good luck at the tables, hope you're doing well, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.